Growing up in the church, I had a youth pastor who was very vibrant and full of enthusiasm about the Word of God. And he always used to warn us about sexual sins by saying, be careful who you lay with because you might catch something that you can't shake off. And if you think about it, there is much more than what meets the eye to a person. For each individual, you can't see what type of spirit this person has. You can't see what kind of spirit follows their bloodline. And if you knew all of these things, you certainly wouldn't jump into bed with anyone who isn't your husband or wife. A story is told of a young man and a young lady who started dating. Now, they met outside of the church, but the young lady was very much an active member of her local church. Now, the first mistake that this young lady made was believing that the young man was a Christian. All she did was ask him the question, are you a Christian? And he said yes. He lied. The second mistake was that, despite being warned about sexual immorality, despite knowing that fornication is a sin, a dangerous sin, despite knowing that the Bible says, let the marriage bed be undefiled, despite knowing better, she gave herself to this young man. Now, before I go any further, I want you to know that the Bible warns us against sexual immorality because it's the type of sin that gives the devil access to your very soul. When a man and a woman under the covenant of marriage have sex, they become one flesh. And this order of things is blessed by God. But when you go outside of God's order of things, when you begin to have sex outside of marriage, whether it's fornication, adultery, or pornography, you are leaving yourself wide open for the devil's attack. You're wide open because you have stepped outside of God's boundary. You've gone against God's plan and his way of doing things. So your choices are extremely important. Now, once this young man and this young lady became involved intimately, slowly but surely, things started to change. Nothing dramatic happened at once, but it was more of a gradual change. Now, the young lady started becoming less and less active in the church. She started attending church less and less. At the beginning, she thought she could change him and bring him closer to God. But the opposite happened. He took her further and further away from the Lord. And so one day, there was a huge conference at her church called Revival Weekend. They held this conference once a year, and it was a time when all the church staff, all elders, deacons, and church members would pray and fast for weeks leading up to the service. They were hungry for a move of God. They were hungry for a fresh anointing from the Holy Spirit. Now, ever since they started dating, the guy had never stepped foot in the church, no matter how hard she tried to persuade him. But for this event, she finally convinced him to attend. On the first night, they were both in the building and halfway throughout the service. This young man started to feel unwell. His face visibly changed and he went home early. On the second and final night of the conference, the same thing started to happen again. The young man's facial expression changed. His demeanor changed. And the young lady with him was extremely concerned. Now he wanted to leave, but she wouldn't let him. She kept telling him to just get prayed for and then they could leave. He was unwilling, but she persisted. And so when it finally came time for the young man to join the congregation and stand in line, the young man started convulsing. He started to violently shake and obviously this attracted the pastor's attention. The pastor and the fellow believers surrounded him and began to pray. They prayed and prayed. And it became clear that this young man was being delivered from some kind of demonic spirit. As all of this was going on, the young lady was standing a short distance away, and she had a terrified look on her face. She looked on in horror because she realized 
that she had been involved with a man who had a demonic spirit. Suddenly it dawned on her that although she wasn't under the influence of a demonic spirit, this spirit had clearly played a part in her backsliding. And this is the danger of sexual immorality. The young man looked normal. Nothing about him appeared to be outrageous or anything, but yet here he was being delivered from a demon. The lesson here is that when you step outside of God's boundaries, you expose your soul and your spirit to the devil. God put boundaries in place for our protection so that we would not be hurt or led into bondage. For everything you do, there is a consequence. For every choice you make, there's a consequence. And the thing about consequences is that they are never advertised from the offset. This is the case with sin. The devil will never advertise sin with a disclaimer. The devil will never advertise adultery and tell you that the consequences of it are a broken home, a broken family unit, a broken covenant before the Lord, a defilement of the temple of the Holy Spirit. And likewise, the devil will never tell you that when you commit sexual sin, you're opening the door for him to enter. Let me tell you something. Whenever you commit sexual sin, there is an imprint left on your soul. There is a record left in the spirit. This is why when Jesus met the woman at the well, he was able to tell her that she had multiple husbands. Her sexual sin left an imprint. So saints of God, we need to live in purity. There are consequences to our actions. The Amplified Translation of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18 to 20 says, Run away from sexual immorality in any form, whether thought or behavior, whether visual or written. Every other sin that a man commits is outside the body, but the one who is sexually immoral sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is within you, whom you have received as a gift from God, and that you are not your own property. You were bought with a price. You were actually purchased with the precious blood of Jesus and made his own. So then, honor and glorify God with your body. The lesson that we all need to learn is that you cannot fight sexual temptation. You have to flee. You cannot negotiate with sexual immorality and try to work your way around it. You have to to flee. That's the best way to deal with it. And that's the only way to deal with sexual temptation. There used to be a time when sin was called by its right name. When people were not afraid to say sin was sin. There used to be a time when there were standards and limits. This was acceptable. That was unacceptable. Moral standards and limits were known and respected. Godly standards were known and upheld. There used to be a time when engaging in particular behaviors and activities was frowned upon, and people would be ashamed to participate in them. There used to be a time when sexuality was something private between a husband and a wife, and to deviate outside of that was unthinkable. Sure, people have engaged in sinful behavior all throughout history, but it was never something to be celebrated and elevated until now. Now, it's my belief that the devil has been quietly at work. He has been subtle and he's been cunning. And what he's done is he's used entertainment. <laughs> he's used music. He's used all forms of media and everything available to dismantle godly values relating to sex. The standard 
of God's word is that marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled. But the devil has perverted this and promoted fornication in music, in movies, in society. Now marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled. But the devil has promoted adultery and affairs. Satan has built this kind of an acceptance among people that sex outside of marriage is no longer a sin. His lies are that there is no shame. There is no consequence in sexuality outside of marriage. His lies are that there is no shame. There's no consequence when it comes to how many sexual partners one can and should have. My friends, we're living in an age where sexual sin has been normalized by the devil. But there are four effects that sexual sin has that I'd like to bring to your attention. The first effect of blatant sexual sin is that you are opening spiritual doors with another person. And more often than not, you do not know what lies behind those doors. So what does this mean? Well, when we engage in sexual sin, we engage in sin against our own bodies. Sexuality is spiritual. It was designed by God as a spiritual tie between a husband and a wife. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. That's what the Bible says. So, even when it is distorted, this principle still holds true. It's true for non-marital sexual behavior. When you join with another person, you are still united as one flesh, and there is a spiritual tie that is made. Listen, when you do this, You open yourself up spiritually. And the point here is that you don't know where the other person has been. You don't know what spirits they've united themselves with that are now united with you. When you lay down with them, you don't know what you're opening yourself up to. We tend to think that God was being repressive and cruel in limiting sexual behavior when in fact, He was trying to protect us from powers and principalities, the rulers of the darkness of this age, and spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. And so the question I have is why won't we heed God's warning? So the first effect of sexual sin is that you open yourself up spiritually. Now the second effect of sexual sin is that you are making soul ties and attachments to someone who is potentially destructive for you. In addition to the potential of taking on the spirits of multiple partners, you are also uniting yourself with people that will be destructive for your soul, your spirit, and your life in general. And oh, be careful. Be careful who you unite yourself to. One example from scripture is Ahab and Jezebel. That's in 1 Kings. Ahab was already wicked, but his union with Jezebel took his wickedness to another level. His attachment to Jezebel was extremely destructive for him and for the nation of Israel. When you tie your soul to someone whose soul is not committed to following the ways of God, You open your soul up to corruption. Don't you know that whoever you choose to unite yourself with can have an influence on your soul? And when you're talking about sexual sin, you're talking about uniting your soul with another soul. So if you're uniting your soul with multiple other souls who have been uniting with multiple other souls, You now have soul ties with people 
who you've never even met. Multiple people you have never met. Personally, I would want to know what souls are in me. I'd prefer to have only one, as a matter of fact. We must always be on guard against those corrupting influences. And we have to guard our souls. The third effect of sexual sin is separation from God. The Apostle Paul tells us that the wages of sin is death. Ultimate death is separation from Jesus Christ. If we are actively engaging in sin, we are actively separating ourselves from God. And if we are actively separating ourselves from God, we are actively choosing to walk into death. I don't know about you, but I'd much prefer to walk into life, not death. Are a few minutes of pleasure worth an eternity of pain? Are a few casual relationships worth your eternal relationship with God? No, no. There is no greater state of being than being in the presence of God. Let us rid ourselves of the sins of the flesh and throw ourselves into the life of the Spirit. Now, the final effect of sexual sin is that your desire will take you captive. The longer you entertain it, The longer you're in it, the more you become a slave to it. I can't think of a better case to illustrate this than Samson's story over in Judges 13 to 16. God called Samson to deliver his people from the Philistines. However, Samson had a weakness for sexual sin. Repeatedly, he gets off track of his mission. And he is derailed by his relationship with Philistine women. Judges 14 verse 3 says it plainly. Then his father and mother said to him, Is there no woman among the daughters of your brethren or among all my people that you must go and get a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? And Samson said to his father, Get her for me. For she pleases me well. Samson was completely ruled by his passions and desires. And they became his undoing. He ended up powerless, blind, and rotting in a jail cell. Rather than fulfilling the purpose God had called him to. Engaging in sexual sin will derail you from God's purpose in your life. Beloved. Let us turn away from those things which God has forbidden and let's run to the things that he has approved. God has not given us these rules to be harsh and cruel. He has given them because he is trying to spare us trouble. He's trying to spare us heartache and pain. Let us take heed of God's word and let's flee from sexual immorality. Let us repent and seek to be washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Let us live in purity, chasing holiness and chasing Jesus.